The next poet you're working with in the Victorian era is Robert Browning. You can see an etching of him here. Uh, Browning was the son of a bank clerk, and he lived in middle class in a middle class London suburb. Now um, he was equally influenced by his mother's devoutness and her love of music. She was a professional pianist, as well as his father's scholarly interests. Um, his dad had over 6,000 volumes in his personal library, and Browning himself was educated at home, uh, largely by his father and some hired tutors, uh, but it was very unconventional tastes. Now, as a child, uh, Browning decided very early on that he wanted to be a poet and never seriously pursued anything else. Uh, he idolized Shelley. And if you think about what we learned with Shelley, Shelley had that very radical lifestyle. Browning really idolized him. Uh, he was supported by his parents, both ideologically and financially. Um, and after a few years of non-production because of familial responsibilities, he eventually became one of the most popular poets in England. Browning was really interested in uh, what your book called the morbid psychology of humans, um, really that kind of darkness in the human spirit. If you think about Edgar Allan Poe, Browning is kind of the British equivalent of of Poe. Poe who explored the sort of darker corners of um, man's mind. Browning really did the same thing. The dominant form that Browning used was a dramatic monologue. And so here's our definition of dramatic monologue. A dramatic monologue in poetry is similar to a monologue or a soliloquy in theater. The poem is told by a character of the poet's creation, some kind of a fictional persona, some kind of fictional identity. It's not the poet speaking himself. So do not confuse the narrator of a dramatic monologue with that of the poet. It's a character that the poet has created. The audience to whom this character is speaking is implied. It's up to us as readers to sort of figure out who our character, first person, is talking to. That means the speaker in a dramatic monologue is not addressing us, the reader. He's addressing some unnamed listener who does not respond. There's no dialogue in a dramatic monologue, but it's up to the reader to use the speaker's words to make inferences and draw conclusions about the speaker's state of mind and personality. So the poem that we're going to work with from Browning is written in the first person, but the I pronouns that are used, that's not Browning himself, it's his character. We saw this with uh, Tennyson's Ulysses. Remember that poem was as if it were Ulysses himself speaking. Tennyson and Ulysses, not the same person. So I'm going to read you Porphyria's Lover. That's the poem we're working with from Browning. Uh, and then I'll go back through it and just briefly touch on some of the, the key items. The rain set in early tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vesk the lake. I listened with heart fit to break when glided in Porphyria. Straight she shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm, which done she rose and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat and let the damp hair fall, and last she sat down by my side and called me. When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced and stooping made my cheek lie there and spread over all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me, she too weak for all her heart's endeavor to set its struggling passion free from pride and vainer ties to sever and give herself to me forever." But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her and all in vain. So she was come through wind and rain. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain felt she. I am quite sure she felt no pain, as a shut bud that holds a bee. 
I warily oped her lids, again laughed the blue eyes without a stain, and I untightened next the tress about her neck, her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still, the smiling rosy little head, so glad it had its utmost will, that all it scorned at once is fled, and I its love am gained instead, Porphyria's love. She guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard and thus we sit together now and all night we have not stirred and yet god has not said a word okay so like i said this is a dramatic monologue we have a character here we have a character who in the beginning of uh this poem is sort of sitting in this dark cold cottage that's near a lake there's a storm outside it's raging winds it's vexing vexing means anger it's anger it's making the lake angry nature's nature's angry here nature's in upheaval then porphyria comes in and she is the one who starts up the fire and warms up the cottage uh, and then she sits down beside our speaker she sits down beside our speaker telling him how much she loves him and you know you can kind of picture this right he's sitting there sort of sullen and somber and in the dark and just like brooding in his own head and she comes in uh, and makes tries to make everything a little bit more cheerful he thinks so she's too weak to give herself over to him forever but the minute he looks up at her face he looks into her eyes he realizes that she worships him and he doesn't know what to do and so at that moment, he figures out one thing to do. He strangles her with her own hair. And the question is why? Why that moment? Well, he realizes, at least in his mind, at that moment, she worships him. And so by killing her at that moment, no, she can't ever change. She can't ever not worship him, where they're stuck sort of in that in that relationship and so think about this tableau this picture that's being painted here at the end so at first at the beginning the opening scene she comes and sits by him and lays his head on her shoulder and tells him how much she loves him and now here at the end it's the other way around right he props her head on his shoulder and they're sitting there quite peacefully so we have this idea about control, about turning her into an obedient object, but then we have this one word, this line at the end, God has not said a word. So the question, is he confessing? Is he asking for forgiveness? Is he looking for judgment? Or is he saying God has not said a word as a way to prove that God isn't judging him for what he has done? And so with that in mind, we've got multiple levels here of interpretation. So on the surface, it's what it looks like, this insane speaker who's committed a murder and trying to, you know, justify it. Remember, it's a dramatic monologue. We can't always trust the speaker's uh, perception or what we get as a speaker's perception, an unreliable narrator, in a sense. Um, you could also read this as Porphyria representing a disease and that killing her is recovering from the disease. Uh, Porphyria... what? as a disease was newly identified in the Victorian era. In fact, a lot of, there were a lot of scientific discoveries in medicine, especially in the Victorian era. So it's possible that this whole poem is sort of an allegory for conquering a disease. Or you could go another step, and we, we talked a little bit about this with um, the Lady of Shalott, that porphyria could represent art, and this idea that when art is created and when it is actually put forth to the public, it is in a sense dead because it can no longer change, it can no longer develop. And so in that sense is porphyria representing art or the creative process. So there you go, Porphyria's Lover in a Nutshell.